to introduce our next speaker, Imre Rusha, who speaks on additive decomposition of square free numbers. Please. Thank you. And let me start by telling how I admire that Mel still can keep smiling after this uh, uh, trying uh, long list of talks. And uh, while it is uh, a better experience to be on a conference and talk to the participants, on the other hand, still, I am <coughs> very reluctant to fly. It is a lot easier to me to be here on the web conference. Oh, sorry, excuse me, Imre, it's a little bit difficult to hear you. Uh, so let could me try you the microphone. A bit more loudly. Microphone. Is it now better? A tiny bit, yes. Or now? Yes, it's better. So I will <clears throat> tell you about additive decomposition of square free numbers. And the motivation came from uh, Ostman's problem about decomposition of primes. So it is easy to see that the complete set of primes cannot be a sum set, but it is uh, seems to be very difficult to decide whether a removal of a finite element can change the situation or not. <clears throat> Probably not, but it is still unsolved in spite of uh, lots of efforts. And uh, I guess the best approximation uh, is due to Christian Elholz, who also <clears throat> gives a reason why the present methods will uh, never give a complete solution. Now, square free numbers are similar to primes in several aspects, and there are differences. The similarity is that I cannot solve the analogous problem either. The difference is that I can at least show some related results which do not have an analog form primes. So I don't know whether there is a subset which is equal to the square free numbers up to a finite number of elements. At this moment, I cannot even tell whether the complete set is a, a subset or not. This is a, probably a finite question. I mean, if the answer is not, it is possible to uh, decide this in a finite number of steps, just as was uh, lazy to do this. Uh, probably it is quite possible to decide whether it is a multiple subset or subset or not. And uh, in an email, uh, Els has uh, told me that he, he can do this for four. Now the things that are can do are the following. It is possible to approximate the square free numbers by a sum set up to a set of density zero. So, and we can do this even for as many summons as we want. There are sets whose sum set contains all the square free numbers and the excess has density zero. Uh, I inserted the name of in the theorem the word infinite, which is more or less necessary. So if they have more than one element, there must be infinite if they have to approximate the set S. Uh, so this was from outside. 
I know less about an approximation from inside. I expect a positive answer for this either. So I think there could be infinite sets whose some set consists only of squarely numbers and contains almost all of them. Uh, no, so this would mean density zero, and I can do this with for the density as near to zero as you wish. So given every positive epsilon, we can find infinite sets whose subset is contained in the set of square numbers, and not only the subset has a density almost six over pi square, which is the density of square numbers, but uh, one of the summands, say A, has this property too. <clears throat> now, the prime analogs of these questions are uh, quite open. So uh, analog of the first uh, uh, result about square feet numbers would ask for two sets A, B, whose some set contains the primes and such that the excess is smaller than the set of primes itself. So in this case, it, uh, the proper interpretation would not be density zero, which is quite easy, but the density less than the density of the primes, that is less than x over log x elements up to x. And for the approximation inside, we can ask whether there are infinite sets whose some set is contained in the set of primes. Uh, now, under the prime k tab hypothesis, we have a positive answer, and Granville has a paper in which, under the same hypothesis, more general some sets are constructed uh, within the set of primes. Now, uh, if the set contains an infinite subset, this implies a weaker form of prime top hypothesis. The prime top hypothesis means that uh, given some uh, linear forms, there are values for which all those linear functions assume primes, unless there is a congruence to present this. And uh, with recent advances towards the uh, twin prime conjecture, some special cases of this uh, are established. So perhaps this problem is not as hopeless as it uh, would seem a few years ago. Still, I don't see any direct connection. Now, uh, the situation changes remarkably if we do not restrict ourselves to positive numbers. So take the set of signed square feet numbers, both positive and negative, as prime. And uh, this set uh, is a k-fold subset. Even we can request that every square feet number is represented exactly once. Uh, I have a similar conditional result about signed primes, not for any number of summons, but at least for two uh, under the prime tuple hypothesis, which seems to be necessary for all uh, 
uh, such sort of investigations. Now, I will tell you a few words about the proof. <coughs> uh, not quite the proofs themselves. So let me tell you how I prove the approximation from outside. So the claim is that there are sets, any number of them whose some set contains wealthy numbers and very few others. And uh, first, uh, we need an easy result about sets modulo p squared. So we want to to get mainly squared numbers. We want to resect the residues of our sets modulo every p squared. And to do this, we need collections of sets of residues modulo p squared u sub 1 up to u sub k as small as possible such that the sum set is exactly all the residues except the zero and since there are p squared minus one numbers to be represented the most we can hope for is the case of this and indeed we can this very easy start with representation of numbers in the base are the cases of p squared minus one uh, and with a little moving of some elements uh, we can get such collection of finite sets of residues. Now, we cannot restrict residue of a number for every prime because probably possibly there are no solutions, but we can restrict them for so more primes. So let omega of n be the bound up to which the product of primes is less than square root of n divided by k, the number of summons they want. This is about half of log n. And for every prime p, take sets u sub 1 p and so on, whose subset contains every residue modulo p squared except the zero and uh, put a number into a sub i if it is in the prescribed set of residues modulo p square up to prime of p less than omega n and also put zero uh, in each set now it is easy to see that uh, every square free number is in the sum set to take a square free number s take the product of primes up to omega it should be omega of s let this number be q and uh, uh, <coughs> represent our number s modulo each prime by uh, some of the residues from uh, our fixed set. So this congruence has a solution modulo q squared. Q u squared is less than our number S. So uh, we can find numbers B1 up to BK whose sum uh, 
gives our number s modulo q squared. Now we keep these numbers except one to which we add a multiple of q so that the sum gives exactly our number s. Uh, these are numbers, the sum of which is our number s, and uh, uh, to see that they are in our sets AR, we need to check some congruences, and we have assumed those congruences up to omega of s, and the numbers themselves are less than s, so the congruence holds for them as well. Now, what about numbers in the sum set which are not square free? If we have a sum and none of the summons is very small, very small meaning a small power of x with the exponent depending on k, then the sum is not divisible by any square of any prime up to the omega of this x to delta, which is a constant times log x. So if it is not square free, the square divisor must contain large prime divisors, p square for the, that the prime p is bigger than m, and uh, there are x over p squared multiples of, a, of p squared. And if we sum this for all primes bigger than m, we get a number which is less than x over m, so less than x over log x. We can add an extra log log if we want to. Now, if If not all summons are large, so one of them is very small, small than, smaller than x to delta, then uh, we cannot tell whether they are square free or not, but the total number of such uh, sums is small. The, outline of the estimate of this number goes as follows. Find numbers alpha, beta in the between delta and one, <clears throat> such that no summons lies between x to the alpha and x to beta, and beta is a lot larger than alpha. And uh, to find such alpha and beta, we just need a pigeonhole argument. Now the large summons are in a small number of residue classes module of p squared because for each p squared the number of possible residues is about the case root of p squared and the are at most k minus one such elements. So quite less than p squared for all some small primes. And this means that they are a lot less than q squared residue classes model of q squared, where q is not very small it is a power of x. So the number, the sum of big summons is a small number. We can save an exponent of x. And when we add a trivial estimate for the number of small sums, we still get an exponent which is less than one. 
so for the big summons, we can have a lot stronger estimates than the for the small sums summons than the x over log x we had for the large ones. Now I tell a few words about the approximation from inside. <clears throat> so for a number t, let S sub t be the set of some, such square phi numbers and for which n plus t is not square free anymore. And the claim is that for every epsilon, there is a number t such that uh, this set S sub t has a density less than epsilon in a very strong sense. The number of elements up to x is less than epsilon times x, not for large x, but for all x. And uh, <clears throat> this lambda implies the theorem easily. So we take such numbers t for epsilon over to epsilon four over four and so on. And one of the summons will contain zero and these numbers t. For into A, we put those numbers n for which every n plus b is square free, we cannot put anything more. So this is the best choice for A. And what is this? We take the set S, which means S plus zero is square free and uh, omit those for which S plus T one or S plus T two or anything is not square free anymore. And this is S minus the union of those sets S sub Ti. And uh, <clears throat> the number of omitted elements will be less than epsilon times X. And uh, this, if we want this to work, we need an, indeed an estimate for every X, not on the asymptotically. An asymptotical estimate is easy because of the almost periodic substructure of square free numbers. Uh, take a number k such that the sum of reciprocals of squares bigger than k is very small and form the product of all small primes. And this number almost works. So if n is square free and n plus q is not square free, then since it must have a prime divisor which is bigger than this k, uh, on the other hand, it cannot be bigger than the square of the number itself. So we have an estimation. We need to add the number of multiples of such prime squares for a fixed prime that cannot be more multiples than x over p squared plus one. Now this plus one is the bad news. So the estimate we get is delta times x, which is fine, plus the number of primes up to square, essentially square root of x, x square root of x plus q, which is fine if unless x is very small and q dominates and that is, and you cannot uh, exclude that this happens. So it may be that one plus q, two plus q, three plus q and so on, all have square divisors, which spoils the situation for small x. And my solution is the following. If besides q, 
we consider all multiples up to a huge bound, then by a not completely obvious averaging argument, uh, we can see that one of them will work. This is all I wanted to tell. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Imre. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, uh, if there are any questions for our speaker. If not, then Emery, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. We have now a 30 minute break. Um, and we resume at 1030 New York time, 430 in Europe, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, um, I think there is a question in the Q&A chat. Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, Daniel Glasscock asks, wait a minute, let me just see what I can do about that. Um, okay, I will try to read the question, but somehow I don't find now the Zoom screen. Uh, somehow I, okay, now it is good. Uh, but I don't find the question. So I might be unmuted. Um, can you hear me, Ruja? Emery? Yeah, Daniel, you uh, can no, speak. I do. I do. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe I can just ask my question. I, I'm curious whether there's a property of primes that would follow from knowing that it is uh, um, an infinite sum set. Um, and I guess, for example, bounded bound gaps would follow. Of course, we know that now. So. Uh, is there another property of primes, say, that's just conjectured that would follow if we knew that it was a plus b, maybe minus some uh, kind of uh, And immediate stronger property is that not only bounded gaps, but many, many small gaps uh, after each other. So it means that for every k, there is a length L so that many times in a interval of length L, there are more than K primes. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is a thing which now we do know by the work of on the twin prime question. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but this is still not uh, quite strong to solve the problem. We need some such configurations somehow nested each other into each other. So uh, for the next k, as long as we know now the uh, configuration of k plus one elements um, may not be a continuation of the previous. Uh, block of k elements and so on right but, i think i think i understand uh so uh, so that it seems to me then that the distance between these two problems understanding the sort of consistency between the configurations and understanding whether the primes are a sum set that seems pretty close is that your feeling that the the uh, difficulty and that's sort of the next step in understanding the consistency between these configurations uh that Definitely, the primes are not a sum set, but at least I think they contain a sum set. Mm -hmm. And this is what seems to be now not so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but still, as long as I know, from my understanding, it seems that the configurations which uh, can be proved to exist are some subsets, some un unspecified subsets of a large difference. Mm -hmm. And this does not seem to be strong enough. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the talk. If there are no more questions, again, we thank the speaker and
we start again in 30 minutes.